So hello everyone, I'm grateful because I'm discovering someone. He seems very inspired by what he's doing and I will uh, discover his path and what he loves about what he's doing. So he's Steven Mitchells. Uh, I would love to, to, uh, to let you introduce yourself. What are you doing and what do you love in what you are doing? Well, um, I write books and I'm married to Byron Katie and I love both jobs. I mean, to say, to say they're jobs is ridiculous. They're not work, they're play, they're, they're joy, they're my delight, they're my, they're my passion. And uh, uh, my first priority is for Katie and the marriage, and my second priority, which is almost up to the first, but always takes second place, is writing books. So that's what I love to do. Writing is a way of... Um, it's a kind of meditation for me. It's, uh, I have many years of, of intensive Zen meditation under my belt. I was a, a Zen monk at one point. And writing is just another mode of listening. So I can, I spend a good deal of the day in this mode when I'm not with Katie. Um, so so you, just to be sure to understand, you can, you can you can write and you feel, you feel like a meditation. It is a meditation. It is a meditation. It's, it's, it's to a great extent listening. It's sitting, doing nothing, uh, going inside, and it's a kind of acute listening to nothing. And then waiting. I have a lot of experience and a lot of practice waiting. So it builds up a large reservoir of patience. But it's waiting on the edge of attention for a voice to appear. And then simply uh, writing it down. And then one, once, once the words appear, then there's another stage of the listening where I get to um, fine tune the music of, of that first voice. But, but essentially it's, it's one wonderful, continuous, non-stop meditation. And mm. it, it's just, uh, uh, it provides the most um, intense fascination for me. And um, uh, because, uh, because it's, it's a, a way of finding out what I know that I didn't know I know. Mm. So, and when, when you start to write, do, do you have an intention? Uh, what, what well, you... yeah, there, there, there's a space in between books. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm finished with a book and I don't have uh, a plan for the next one. So there may be weeks or even months when I don't have a focus for my work. So there's nothing particularly going on and I don't know what comes next and it, it's just waiting without the voice. But there comes a moment when I know that a book is going to happen. It's very clear uh, as, as the English, as the Irish poet Yeats once said, um, when, he, when he knows that a poem is finished, it feels like a box clicking shut. There's a very discreet experience of knowing when, for me, of knowing when a book is actually there before even one word is written down. You, you, know, you know it's this book. With absolute cer certainty. Mm. So, so even before I've written a word, there's that click and the book is there. And it's a very joyous experience. So, uh, so then the rest of it is just kind of following the momentum for the next six months or four months or a year when when it it manifests itself, but for me, it's already there. It's it, and and then seeing seeing how it is born is the fascination. Um, it's like uh, like being you know like a woman when she knows she's pregnant, but she doesn't know who the baby is yet. So it's you know it's it, I feel like I'm walking around in a state of absolute pregnancy, but it's. Uh, it's it's forming itself as as the months go along. Mm. Do do you feel sometimes impatient of 
finishing the book? No. And do you have goal of about how long do you need to take to finish it, or it takes the time it takes? Never, never a goal. I mean, not even with a book. I don't even have the the goal of writing a book because that's not my business. Mm. Um, this is something you learn from many years of meditation practice. That um, goals are um, mental conditions that you superimpose onto reality that warp reality really if you if you want to be in touch with your nat the natural shape of events for you then you know don't touch that at least that's how i live yes and when you when you know it's it's uh, this book um then do you how do you organize your ideas how do you the I, I don't you don't I organize my days um the way my days go or you know i I wake up and attend to showering and brushing my teeth, et cetera. And then I, I have breakfast with Katie, uh, which I love to do. And I read her the headlines and the news or sometimes a few stories. And then, and then we separate and I have my day. I have my morning of writing meditation. And then we meet for lunch. And then unless something else is going on, I have my afternoon. In silence, you know, in silence by myself, and then we meet for dinner and spend the evening together. So that's the typical day. So the, the chapter, each 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 chapter in the book, you you discover you discover your own chapter during writing the book. Yes. Okay. Yeah. As I go, as I go. As you go. Now it's different for if I'm working on a translation. You know, I've translated many of the. Um, The, the great spiritual classics from uh, the Tao Te Ching to the Bhagavad Gita to the Book of Job from the Hebrew to the word, selection of the words of Jesus to um, and then s some of the great classics of Western literature like the Iliad and the Odyssey and Gilgamesh and I, I, and I, I would love to have uh, what, what did you learn what is what is the most inspiring things you learned about Gilgamesh for you? I'd have to rephrase the question. It's not what I learned from Gilgamesh, but it's what I learned yes. in the process of translating Gilgamesh. And, and to call it translation is not quite accurate either, because I don't know ancient Babylonian or Akkadian. Um, so I was working with a dozen versions in English, French, and German. Um, To, to give me a sense of what's going on in the original text. My, my impetus for beginning it was that I didn't, I loved, Gil, I mean, I loved Gilgamesh, and I discovered him really through the great German poet Rilke, who said that it was one of the great experiences of his life discovering Gilgamesh. I mean, not just of his reading, but of his actual life. His well, whole, whole what, what, what is Rilke inspiring? Said, Rilke said just, Reading Gilgamesh was one of the great experiences he ever had. So, you know, that was what um, made me examine it. Um, but I, I never, in all the versions that I, that I read, I never heard anything, any kind of music that it was translated into that could match the, the grandeur of the story. So I thought, you know, there must be some way of creating a music in English that would um, be as powerful as this um, ancient uh, uh, aboriginal uh, story with, with this primal energy in it. The music, I wanted it to match that story. So I set out to kind of listen again, listen for a rhythm that in English would, would, would be like, you know, the rhythms of the great classics, the ryth rhythm of Homer in Greek, the, the rhythm of, of uh, the book of Job in Hebrew, which is, you know, such a uh, ferocious experience to, to, to go through in the original language. And the, the trick was to create something in English that would mirror that original music. And I found, I felt, for me anyway, I felt that I found something that worked.
So when, when I heard it for the first time, I said, ah, this is it, I can do it. And, and the, rest was, the rest was a playing out of it. But, the, but you ask about what I discovered. Well, mm. I discovered that music. Mm. And that music encompassed the uh, power of the hero, the power of a story that is the first human story about fear of death and, and somehow uh, dealing with the fear of death. I, I would, what, what, according to you, I don't know if it's easy for you to answer that, um, what, what can we learn from the Gilgamesh story? I mean, I mean, what can we learn, I mean, for our personal life? People in my audience, they love uh, stories where they can learn. It can be stories from real people. It can be simple story of someone in, in my own life or my own story or, or the story of a, a, a legend. Mm -hmm. What can we learn according to you to apply to our personal life? Well, for me, it, it's, it, there's a lot to be learned from Gilgamesh as there is from all of these great works of literature, but it's not a, a, a simple one-to-one -one correspondence. If you really dive into Gilgamesh, with your whole heart, what you're, what, you're, what you're experiencing is a poet's sense of the world, this ancient poet whose work was buried under the rubble of the Near Eastern city for uh, 2,500 years or more and wasn't discovered even until then. We didn't even know that such a work existed. When you give yourself to that poet, you see a sense of an expanded world, a world uh, of... Um, human beings with primal urges, primal uh, abuses of power, primal grief, primal love. It's the first, the first and probably the, the most powerful story of the love between two men. Uh, friendship, um, but, but a passionate friendship between two men. There's nothing like it in, in the rest of world literature. Uh, Maybe, maybe in the Iliad, Achilles and Patroclus. But so, so this, it, it's a way of, of being catapulted into a world of primal colors where, you know, in our world, we, we see things in all sorts of gradations. But this, you know, it's like waking up, opening your eyes in a, in a world of, of, uh, of, t of it, like, an acid trip almost of, of colors that are so bright you have to get used to them. Um, and so it's not only enhanced love and, and power, but also enhanced fear of death because when, this, when Gilgamesh's friend, his dear passionate friend dies, he loses all meaning in life and he feels that he, he can't go on unless he can find a way to uh, conquer death. So that's what it's all about. And he doesn't find the way, but his desire for going beyond death is, to, to my mind, it's a basic human desire. And he can't find the way, but we can. I mean, this, to my mind, all of, all of the stories that I get so passionately interested in uh, like the Iliad and the Odyssey and, and certain Bible stories. I'm working now on the story of Joseph and his brothers from the Bible, which Tolstoy called the greatest, the most beautiful story in the world. So all of these stories are, are in a way, the same story. And the best, the person who's enunciated that story the most clearly is the Buddha. It's the story of suffering and the end of suffering. Mm. So all of these are... Are, are variations on that. Very few of them find their way to the end of the story, the end of suffering. Like Gilgamesh couldn't find a way and has to, has to live without that solution. In, in a, it, the story ends in a, with a kind of sigh. But he doesn't know that there's a, a solution, but we do, or some of us do. And, um, and what is the solution according to you? Well, uh, there's a way of, um, of 
understanding where suffering comes from and then, and then putting an end to it. And Katie says it in the clearest, most powerful way than, that I know, even more, to my mind, even more powerfully than the Buddha did. And, uh, and that is when we understand that all suffering comes from believing our stressful thoughts, that when we don't believe our stressful thoughts, then when we question them, we come to the end of suffering. It's very, very simple. It's difficult to do, but it's simple to understand. That's the story. That's our human story. Suffering and the end of suffering. So all of these great human stories that I get attracted to and then get involved with, if I'm lucky, are really um, variations on that. You can read the Iliad and see sufferings in a, in a thousand different varieties. Um, the suffering that war brings to a, a city or a country or a world and how it all comes from the same thing, the same mechanism that causes you to get annoyed when you're standing in line at the grocery store. I mean, it's the same exact thing, but, you know, micro and macro. So, anyway, that's one way of talking about stories. Do you think the common factor of each powerful story is, is one of the common factors is to have suffering in the story? So let's say that I want to um, write a new story, a new movie. It's important to have in mind that the, we need to have suffering in, during the story to make a powerful story. You think well, to make, it, to make it real, because, uh, you know, if, if you were to take a movie camera to heaven, it would be, it would be boring. Um, that's not to say that he the experience of heaven is boring. It's passionately exciting, but you can't translate that into human drama. For example, if you were to make a film of, of Katie's life, be, I'm giving this as an example because it's something I know very well. Um, it's from the outside it's not interesting to film somebody who's happy all the time uh, so what people would say although from the inside it's the most exciting thing in the world if someone were to make a film of her life you'd start with the woman who was miserable for 10 years and in, in, in depression and then saw something Mm. And the whole world turned so, around. That's the drama of it. Um, although, you know, uh, that's not the most important thing f for me. The most important thing was the, the insight that turned it all around. But yet, yeah, the short answer is yes, because, because uh, that suffering is the texture of human life until it's not. Mm. Do you see common factors, what, what makes a good heroes in stories? Because you studied different kind of heroes, different culture. Do you see a, a, a common factors in, in, in their life? In, so we, we say, it, we say the mm. suffering, because I, I, I don't know if, you, I, I can imagine that you know there is a, a, a book and videos about um, the journey of a hero. Oh, the, uh, Joseph Campbell. Yes, the, exactly. Yeah. Well, yes. So, do do you see patterns like that, maybe different than him? Well, well, for me, the stories that interest me are are stories of heroes with an inner life, which means that there has to be suffering along the way. You know, heroes like the superheroes in comic books or in in movies, you know, to me are total bores because they're they're men. I say men because most of them are men. They're men without an inner life. They're um, completely virtuous. Their life is dedicated to, you know, fighting against evil. And that world of um, good versus evil is not a human world. It's a it's a an imaginative world that, to me, is very shallow. And what is a, what is the world? What is our our true world according to you? Well. It's a world that perceives that good and evil are human projections, and so there is no good and evil. It's us that we perceive good and evil. Yes, and and there was a great, uh, actually a great Zen master, one of the great Zen masters, um, who said in um, a teaching poem 
the struggle between good and evil is the primal disease of the mind. So it's a, it's a, it's a disease that makes, for example, an American president um, launch a war against Iraq to eradicate evil, and we know the results of that. So, you know, when we imagine ourselves as, as the heroes in our lives, you know, and uh, imagine that there are villains out there, and usually it turns out to be our husband or wife, um, we get the whole world uh, messed up in the most um, horrible ways that cause intense suffering. Um, so that good and evil, that it's a very dangerous categories. Mm. Um, and and the, in the stories that you are studying, you see less these splits between. There aren't splits like that. For example, in you know in the Iliad, just to choose one, um, usually usually it, when a country creates an epic poem or an epic novel, um, you know the. Uh, if I'm French, the French will be the heroes and the Germans perhaps might be the villains and vice versa. But in the Iliad, this great, you know, the greatest of Greek epics, the Greeks are not the heroes and the Trojans are not the villains. The Trojans are at least as human as the Greeks and at least as virtuous. And um, the great, the great um, character um, Hector is probably more admirable than any of the Greek heroes. So there's, there's this huge, almost cosmic empathy on the part of the poet who sees everybody as um, a human being, a human and, and doing their best and caught in, in the vice of this horrible, um, horrible mistake. Wars are always a mistake. This horrible mistake that's led to um, not only intense individual suffering, but the destruction of a whole civilization. And he sees that, and he feels that, and he, with the greatest uh, compassion, uh, plays it to the end. Compassion has no pity in it. it he, he, he sees the characters and allows them to go through their insanity with, with, the, with the greatest love, but, but no... Um, no sentimentality whatsoever. So it's 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 an invigorating experience to to be absorbed in that in that great story mm. uh, without villains, without heroes, just with endless compassion. Yes, I I love this topic of good and evil. Um, I, and there, there is two two questions that I have in my mind. Uh, first, do you think we 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 lost uh, because there are a lot of movies about heroes that are only good and fighting only uh, vi villain people. It's, it is where, uh, yes. Um, and so do we, do we lose that? And my other question, um, in a um, uh, series of videos like Game of Thrones, I don't know if you, you watched at least one or two episodes or some series like that, tried now to... Uh, they try to, to, to make the hero not only good, but sh give perspective. And, okay, he's doing that, but you can see what he's destroying at the same time, and also the, the villain. So do, do you think that in the future we'll have more and more um, stories that look like what we created uh, with, uh, like two two thousand years ago, but yes, I don't know if I'm clear on the question, but uh. yeah, I d I don't know. That would be a good thing for humanity if there if there are more human stories rather than these silly um, eight year old stories of good versus evil. Mm. Uh, if I I've I've watched a few episodes from Game of Thrones and I got very bored, but um, if they if that's what they're doing, that's a good thing. Um, we've done it before, many times in these great books, so it shouldn't be too difficult um, for the movies to do it. But um, do, do you know? Yes, um, there is a question because of uh, uh, of uh, what the the people want. Do, do you know a book? I mean, a modern book or a modern movie that went that was 
successful and also has this kind of balanced view of uh, the hero. Um, my, my point, I'm I wondering if, if the majority of people truly want to have, to see a movie or read a book with a hero uh, that is not only a hero, but a hero and a villain. Um, I don't know. I mean, Shakespeare is pretty popular still, so there is that. And we still, you know, we have not modern novels. For me, modern, you might not call it modern, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, like War and Peace and Anna Karenina that are, you know, as large hearted and as mature as um, the Iliad. Uh, in, as far as movies go, it's very hard to find mature movies, at least in my opinion. I love the movies of Ingmar Bergman, which give perspective. They're a little too Christian for me and, and uh, a little too uh, uh, balanced on the side of darkness rather than light, but they're, they're brilliant movies and they're the best movies that I know of that have ever been made. Um, and certainly very, very nuanced and balanced, a little too desperate, but that was Bergman. Um, so, you know, it would be wonderful if, if we could have that in the future. I, I don't see that happening, but you never know. There are always geniuses that are born that, that revolutionize a, an art form. Uh, the way I see it going, um, it, it becomes less and less mature as as the f film producers try to please a, um, a sillier and sillier audience, it seems to me. I I know that in London there is um, a school for children, and from a young age, they give perspective to the young to the to the children and say they they take someone and they start to tell the story, and at the beginning the children say, oh oh, he's a good guy, or oh, he's an evil guy, and then they tell another angle. They, they 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 give them another angle to, to train them to see that it's a matter of perception and perspective. Oh, how wonderful! So yeah. maybe in the future, maybe we'll those like, children will, will love this kind of movie. Yeah, and we'll make the kind of movie. And you you study this history. So according to you, why we are why we are, we are not doing that the way they did it in the past? I don't know. I have no idea. You, you'd have to speak to someone who's a historian of modern yes. culture and uh, who understands the trends that have brought our cult, you know, ourselves to, to this kind of popular culture. I don't know. Mm. I, I would love to, uh, to know, did you have sometimes when you read something, tears of inspiration, like you, you are you are moved with what you read. Oh, often. Often. Yeah. Can you tell me one one time it was like you were a lot moved, but by, by what you are reading and why you were you are inspired? Well, I can. Yeah, I I can. This is one out of many, but um, I I uh, every few years I read. Um, our great American poet Walt Whitman's um, Song of Myself, which is by far his greatest poem. It goes on for 70 or 80 pages. And it, it comes from a, a deep and wide place, a place of, of uh, enlightenment. He's one of the very few poets certainly one of the very few modern poets who had an experience that could be talked about in Buddhist terms of awakening. So in particular, what I want to talk about is not my experience, but my experience of Katie's experience of Walt Whitman. And the first time I read this poem to her, especially that we came to a passage where he's talking about his uh, the insight that changed his life about seeing beyond life and death, of seeing beyond the personal self into a, a, a position of being both in and out of life, of seeing everything happening and seeing that it was all good. So I was reading this passage, it's maybe uh, 
oh, 30 or 40 lines. And as I was reading it, I often have a kind of quiver in my voice as I'm reading it because it's so moving. I looked over at her and, you know, the tears were streaming down her cheek and it was so beautiful. I mean, the, the poem was so beautiful. The reaction was so beautiful of somebody who's taking it in as deeply as it's possible to take in words, taking it in to a depth that mirrors the genuineness of those words because there's, there are no words more genuine to me than those words of Walt Whitman. Uh, you know, it was like this, this, this great music that, that arose in a, a poet's heart that echoed in my heart that was echoing into the heart of my beloved and it was, you know, the, one of the great experiences of my life. I feel that. Yeah. Um, my last question, it could be for teenagers who have the, the dream to become a writer. Uh, some of them, yes, take the time, I feel that you are inspired. <laughs> um, some people can say, yeah, but my parents, they want me to become an engineer. They want me to become a lawyer. What, what, what would you want to say to, to, to someone who wants to become a writer and have this uh, limiting belief that I, I don't deserve it? I'm too young, I'm not intelligent enough, something like that. What you would, what you well, would love I, to say? I, I have two things. First of all, go to thework.com, learn how to question your thoughts, and write it down. And, you know, I'm too young, I can't do this, um, um, I, won't, I won't please my parents, etc. Is it true? And then go through all the other four questions and the turnarounds. That, that's the way to address any kind of confusion in the mind. And, and when you get a little clearer, you'll find out what you ought to be doing. And my second um, answer would be to send them to um, Rilke's Letters to a Young Poet, because he's talking to a, a young poet who has exactly that conflict. His, he's in military school. His parents want him to have a career as a businessman or an accountant or whatever and he wants to write poetry, and, and Rilke has been there himself, and he answers in, in a, a beautiful, um, compassionate, understanding way about what it means to be a writer, what kind of um, passion you have to have, and, and how you have to be, get to the point where you're certain that there's nothing else that you want to do and nothing else that you can do. And, uh, get to the point where there's no choice. And, and then it becomes very simple. What, what, what do you mean by getting, the point, getting to the point where, where there is no choice? Getting, getting so clear in your mind that any other issues, like my parents want this, or I can't do this, or what if I do that? Uh, how am I going to make money? Um, how am I going to afford to, be, to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, etc where all of that drops away and there's just, I have to write. That's mm. it. And just your mission. Well, it, it, and it's, you know, and you can learn this through questioning, through doing the work on, on all of these stressful thoughts. You can learn to get to the point where you know in your bones, in your blood, that once you do what you love to do, everything else in the universe, uh, forms itself around that knowing that, you know, it's up to you to get to the clarity. And once you've done your job with the clarity, you could say um, the universe does its job to match that, to mirror it. So there's no effort anymore. Mm. At least that's my experience. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. What, do you want to advise someone to read one of your books? And no. No, I mean, I mean to, to cho it's hard to choose. Uh, How to choose? Yes. Uh, choose what attracts you most. Okay. <laughs> Best answer. Thank you very much. I have much. a website, stephenmitchellbooks.com, and there are excerpts from all the 20 or 30 or 40 books um, so that people can read these little excerpts and, and see, if that, see if that attracts them. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.